In my opinion, confessional bibliology has generated some helpful criticisms of the mainstream viewpoint I hold on the best way to discover the text of the Greek New Testament. I've often said that it takes the skeptical eyes of the minority to spot problems in the views of the majority. Recently, I claimed in an as yet unpublished paper, still need to fix some things as you'll see, that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 had never been used the way King James and TR defenders use it, not until the 1980s or so. In other words, it was never used to teach the perfect preservation of the biblical text. I believed I'd done my homework, but one of the guys across the aisle from me who can definitely have productive conversations, who has helped me a bit with some projects even, Pastor Robert Vaughn, who does not consider himself part of confessional bibliology, but tends to side with them on many matters of, sub of, uh, of substance, unearthed citations from the 19th century that proved me wrong. It's not fun to be wrong, and I think my bigger points about Psalm 12 still hold, but I was wrong on a specific and what I think was important supporting point. I'm currently revising my paper, as I said, in light of Vaughn's discoveries. None of the 50 or so guys who read the paper before Robert came up with that counter evidence that he found, mostly because they had no reason to. They were already on my side. They were part of the majority. Again, I think it's probably good to have a loyal opposition. The majority can become lax in its self-congratulatory certainty. I think TR defenders have been right to see some of this very laziness in the majority, including myself. But the Overton Company makes windows for a reason. I can no longer, in good conscience, treat confessional bibliology, at least as advanced by its current leading proponents, as part of polite theological company. I interacted with this viewpoint publicly for a long time. I did so because it had and has gifted defenders who I thought might have answers to my questions that I had not anticipated. I no longer believe this. I think I've explored that position more than thoroughly enough, and I don't see what benefit more public conversation will give everyone. Though if they'd like to restart public talks, I have some suggestions for them at the end of this video. Like the evil thereof, my public interaction with confessional bibliology is sufficient for the day. I'm moving on. For those of you who care about the human drama behind public arguments, I want to explain and defend my unilateral ceasefire. I've got three reasons. First, I've achieved clarity on our major impasse. I spent about three years pursuing this. I can't say I worked at it every single day, but I definitely spent many hours trying to find out what leading proponents of confessional bibliology had to say in answer to the questions, which TR is the perfectly preserved one, and why that one? I first established to my satisfaction that they do claim textual perfection. Their appeal lies precisely in their insistence that they can provide the pure, perfect, preserved, certain, absolute, stable, settled, not changing, completed, agreed upon, authentic, fixed text of scripture. All of these are adjectives used by leading confessional bibliologists to describe the textus receptus, in general those editions of the Greek New Testament. But when they are asked to provide the pure, perfect text, they respond with what I can only call confusion, mixed with a strong dash of personal abuse. They insist that this question of mine, and of many others, is a ploy, a dodge, a cheat. It's not sincere, it's a mere stratagem of debate, dust in the eyes. But have they ever wondered why so many people of apparent intelligence and goodwill, and also redheaded YouTubers, keep asking them these two questions? I hold out a tiny bit of hope, I truly do, that I'm the one who's wrong, that what I see as a fatal inconsistency would all be cleared up if I would just work harder at understanding my brothers in the confessional bibliology world. But after literally years of trying, I can't make my eyes see anything else but a massive and central and fatal inconsistency. And when I finally got to pose this inconsistency to today's leading confessional bibliologist, Dr. Jeff Riddle, he insisted that he saw no inconsistency at all. He said, at this point, no, I do not think it is inconsistent to hold to the confessional bibliology position and to confess that God's word has been kept pure in all ages. I'm staring at a great gulf fixed between two statements, and he insists that he can walk over that gulf easily on top of the thin air. I see a gulf he sees not even a crack. We are at an impasse. 
the impasse. The very same impasse I have reached with every single one of the leading defenders of the TR, and it's the same one I've seen others like Kevin Bowder reach with them. They permit themselves to have variants and yet call their texts perfectly preserved. My variants are evidence that I have fallen for what Riddle's recent edited work calls Satan's Bible. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink a perfectly preserved text of the New Testament that isn't actually perfect because such a thing doesn't and can't exist, and horses can't drink invisible, impossible things. I'm weary of pointing out to these brothers a simple error that, from my perspective, they refuse to see. I'd rather go back to pointing out something else they refuse to see, my first love, namely the importance of translating the Bible into our English. Second, I dislike disliking Christian people. Things get so petty so fast with so many, not all, but so many leading King James and TR defenders. With some of them, I knew this would happen, so I kept my distance from the beginning. With others, I saw signs that maybe we could have a profitable dialogue, but was then disappointed by the resulting pettiness. And I'm not saying it's just them. I feel the temptation toward pettiness too. I want to engage in tit for tat, to return railing for railing. I've recently been alarmed, to be honest, at seeing this in my own heart. I found myself plotting eloquent comebacks like Calvin in Calvin and Hobbes after Mo the bully antagonizes him. You should see the savage takedowns that I left unpublished. It's actually true. They would make Mo the bully weep, I promise. Only in a way, I'm the bully here. I represent the majority viewpoint. I have nicer production values. <laughs> John Newton said that writers of controversy often get twisted by their work. And I felt that twisting pressure. I feel it, and I don't like it. I dislike disliking Christian people. Now, an odd thing uh, has happened in this debate. A few guys across the aisle from me have become my genuine friends. Friends, as Lewis said, stand shoulder to shoulder, looking at the same thing. And because of our great mutual interest in debates over the text and translation of scripture, sometimes my debate opponents understand me better than friends who aren't as interested in this debate. I have found voices on the other side that can have a conversation that seem to me to be engaged in the common pursuit of truth. They just don't predominate in that group. You know this when they give a little and when they consistently interpret you correctly even in disagreement and when they don't take every opportunity to trumpet minor flubs of yours and when they don't rejoice to see their enemies stumble when they exhibit Christian character and when, frankly, you don't find yourself in a situation in which every single interaction goes south. I dare say that some of my enemies love their enemies, and I sense it, but some don't. How can it be that godly Christians would disagree over the text and translation of Scripture? Shouldn't all the good be on one side and all the evil on the other? No. Theologically, no. The line between good and evil doesn't run between political parties or between Bible translations. To paraphrase Solzhenitsyn, who is himself paraphrasing the Bible, I'd say. No, that line runs through every human heart. Fundamentally, I trust people who recognize, even in sharp disagreement, that some good lies in my party and some evil lies in theirs. I try to do the same. God help me, I want to do the same. One huge reason that I stuck to this debate so long was that I wanted to find every bit of good confessional bibliology had to offer me. What truths were these smart men seeing that I wasn't? What good lay at the center of their view? But I believe I have done my due diligence and have come to the end of that pursuit. And one reason I know that I've reached the end is that a significant number of my public interactions with confessional bibliology have made it difficult for me to love my debate opponents. Maybe there's more truth to discover. I just don't think I have the sanctification to discover it. Third, my opponents have gone to extremes that I find I cannot in good conscience continue to interact with publicly. Confessional Bibliology recently had what I tend to think was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to define and promote itself to the outside world. They got their very best guys together, the most knowledgeable and capable Christian proponents of their view. This wasn't a set of random Facebook posters piling on. 
It wasn't a uh, book generated by a reformed AI bot. Around two dozen such ministers with degrees and pastorates and frankly pretty good prose got together to write Why I Preach from the Received Text, an anthology of essays from reformed ministers. And yet, the book included these lines. Modern translations based on Satan's Bible that omit some of the Word of God include the New American Standard Bible, New International Version, English Standard Version, and many others. As I said in my review of this book, these words are so far over the top that I do not consider them worthy of response. I questioned both of the editors on this wording, Brother McShaffrey and Brother Riddle, and both stood by the words. I happen to know that at least one contributor who was invited to write for the volume pulled out when he saw that that contributor was invited too. And yet the editors kept these words and other mentions of Satan's Bible in the same piece, and the pieces claim that the King James contains no demonstrable errors. The leading proponents of confessional bibliology don't see these words as extreme. My wife once said to me, be careful, honey, what you say in the heat of debate, your most extreme statement will be taken ever after to represent your true position. If I were to say in the heat of a live debate extemporaneously, it were better that we were without the King James Version, away with it to the bottom of the bargain bin. If I were to say that, my opponents would ever after tag me, and rightly and understandably so, with hating the King James, with revealing my true feelings for it. They already tag me with that charge every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, even when I give them zero evidence for it. I love the King James. But this official representation of confessional bibliology's views was not dashed off in a moment. It was the considered and purposeful wording of grown Christian men. This extreme statement must be taken to represent their true position. And I am dismayed. And this is not the only extreme statement that I've seen from the sect known as confessional bibliology. One well-trained defender of the King James Version whose work has been repeatedly cited and endorsed by proponents of confessional bibliology and who seems I gather to have joined their party recently insisted to me that changes in English since 1611 are all due to the rise of the Enlightenment and of expressive individualism. Even Noah Webster, 200 years ago, was demonstrating that he was touched by the rising evil surrounding him when he proposed the very same ideas that I have proposed. We say soon where they said anon, because sin, I pointed out to this gentleman, whom I am embarrassed to name, I find his ideas so linguistically bizarre, that he uses English as it currently is. Isn't he then giving in to the very evil he's decrying? He responded that we ought to hold on to all the meanings of English words, the old and the new. This view is so linguistically impossible that I'm just left spluttering and lamenting. I know some very smart men whose prodigious intellectual gifts and years of training have been terribly twisted by their devotion to defending the King James and TR. They defend the King James at all costs, even some costs that no one should be willing to pay. There are some ideas out there that are so extreme that I find I can't answer them without violating the wisdom of Proverbs. Let me state it clearly. It is extremism to insist that the Bible promises perfect preservation of the text of Scripture with zero doubt and yet to admit that one's preferred Greek New Testament isn't perfect and that some of its readings are in doubt, and then to see utterly no reason why anyone else would call this inconsistent. It is extremism to look at the careful work of the conservative evangelical NASB translators and say that their work is based on Satan's Bible. It is, as my friend Tim Berg has said on the Textual Confidence Collective videos, it's like the Pharisees looking at the work of the Spirit and Jesus and calling it the work of demons. It is extremism to believe that language change over the last 400 years is both sinful and something we should all keep up with so we can use words in all their senses. When does a sincere argument become a quarrel that the servant of the Lord should not engage in? Now. I have nothing left to say to extremism on this scale, lest I be likened to it. I've actually shot this conclusion to this video three other times. I've rewritten it with input from a little ministry board I have like five times. I want to be super careful what I say here. And in God's good providence, I got a little wisdom recently from a podcast I listened to. 
the host pointed out that in politics, people often look at those with whom they have 70% agreement, and instead of building on what they share, they decide to focus on the 30% disagreement, which quickly becomes a 100% disagreement. They become enemies. I don't want this to happen with my brothers in confessional bibliology. I think I'm at like 95% theological agreement with most of you, brothers. I want to regain complete unity with you, as I do with my IFB, King James only brothers. Here's the problem. You spend most of your time, brothers, saying that the Textus Receptus is 100% perfect and that any textual uncertainty whatsoever equals no epistemic foundation for Christianity and indeed is an indication of Satan's Bible. No compromise or peaceful coexistence is possible with such a view. I'm convinced that this textual absolutism is the source of a ton of the division and strife that I think is generated by confessional bibliology. I saw this growing up in IFB King James Onlyism. It leads you all too often to nasty rhetoric that really is just beyond the pale. Here's me beyond the pale. It leads you to say things that are way over the top. Here's me over the top. You don't just cheer for your text. You actively condemn mine as wicked. My Bible isn't just a little less than ideal for textual or translational reasons. It's satanic. I'm not just wrong, I'm a proto-liberal or an actual liberal. It's not often that three-time BJU graduates are called liberals. I should probably enjoy the feeling while I can. The only other time I can remember this particular charge coming in public debate was when strongly King James only IFB Institution Pensacola Christian College brought this same accusation against my alma mater in the late 1990s. Incidentally, maybe not so incidentally, with the help of a writer widely cited in confessional bibliology circles, Theodore Letus. The Westminster Confession leans you towards the TRs. Fine, brothers, I lean toward the critical text. But your textual absolutism has turned this disagreement into division, conversation into contention, healthy debate into strife. I do not condemn the TRs. They are excellent copies of the Word of God. I do not condemn the King James Version. It is not Satan's Bible. It is God's Bible but so is the very meanest translation of the Word of God, as someone once said. When I push for the King James to be replaced in pulpits and other institutional contexts, I'm not saying anything negative about the King James Version, and I'm saying precisely nothing about the TRs, because I'm more than open, as you are not, to the use of contemporary TR-based Bibles. I blame the impersonal force of language change for the decreased intelligibility of the King James Version. I'm not saying the King James is bad any more than I'm saying that Tyndale and Wycliffe are bad. I'm saying the King James is no longer our English. It was saying this that first made you see me as an enemy. I don't want to be your enemy. I don't want to cherish hostility against any brother in Christ. If you want to talk publicly again with me, and of course you may not, which is your prerogative, you need to address and correct the impasse that I've named. You need to back off of the extremist statements that you've recently made and or endorsed. You need to self-consciously adopt a textual confidence view and openly reject an absolutist one. If this happens, I think you may have some genuinely valuable critiques to make of the mainstream view of textual criticism. But as long as you are mired in extremism, the church won't be able to hear any kernels of truth that you may have discovered. One of the most troubling questions that I face as a Christian is why the Lord allows servants who appear to me to be otherwise very good men to fall into embarrassing doctrinal errors. These men seem just as bewildered at my failure to see the truth as I am at theirs. We both pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other's viewpoint. The prayers of neither are answered fully. I don't know why. I take refuge in the mercy and final judgment of the Lord. My brothers in confessional bibliology, I love you. I insist that I do, though sometimes I struggle. So help me, God. I have prayed for you many times. I went to sleep last night praying for you, especially for those of you I dislike disliking. And some of you do engage me constructively in private settings. I plan to continue these conversations, if you'll have me. I also have a written debate going with Brother Christian McShaffrey over second person pronouns in the King James, one in which I've already finished my share. I'm gonna let that go to print. I've shared my basic concerns in this video with him privately, but I'm taking a decided step back, four score steps back. If I talk about the far larger group of traditional mainstream IFB King James onlyists, and you, my confessional bibliology brothers, think that I'm subtweeting you, I'm telling you in advance, that is not my fault.
My brothers in confessional bibliology, I want to leave you with one encouragement. Be more confessional, not less. In your blogs and videos and articles and conferences, dedicate as much energy to the second half of Westminster Confession 1.8 as you do to the first half. That first half is your favorite part, I get it, the part that says the text of the Hebrew Bible and Greek New Testament, these two texts, have been kept pure in all ages. Whether your interpretation of that phrase in the confession is accurate, I, I'm just going to have to let confessional scholars figure out. I think there's still some work to do there. I just don't feel like that's my fight. But maybe you're right. Maybe you, to be confessional, should stick with the TRs to honor your tradition. Be bibliological recobites. Fine. As long as you're not absolutist about it and not condemning my text as satanic, I'm okay with this. I've always been okay with this. By all means, use the New King James Version or Modern English Version. But as my friend Matthew Everhard said in his excellent review of why I preach from the received text, which, if Matt is right, would probably have been better titled Why I Preach from the Authorized Version, WCF 1.8, doesn't stop where you do, brothers. It goes on. Because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God who have right unto and interest in the scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, those same scriptures. Therefore, they, the scriptures, are to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation unto which they come. I think this is a simple and biblical argument. I love these lines. The Bible simply does not tell us how to choose among variants in the manuscript tradition of the Greek New Testament. So I am eager to allow you some amount of liberty there, brothers, a liberty I wish you would grant to me. What the Bible does clearly say in 1 Corinthians 14 is that edification requires intelligibility. So the most serious disagreement that I have with confessional bibliology is that as long as the great majority of its proponents insist that the often archaic King James Version must be retained and no other Textus Receptus translations into vulgar English, common English, today's English, can be trusted, as long as they insist that the dead words and false friends created by language change are no barrier whatsoever to understanding, as long indeed as they tell me that language change is sinful and must be resisted, proponents of confessional bibliology, and I speak to you brothers, you are neither confessional nor, more importantly, biblical.